Thanks, Janice. So I've been working with uh, Malcolm McCulloch for the last uh, five months, and today's presentation is more of a presentation about a research project that's just underway rather than uh, any res hard results or any answers to a question at the moment. So everyone in the audience probably already knows what ocean acidification is, so for that reason I'm going to skip the introduction about ocean acidification. So my talk today is about coralline algae, how they might respond to ocean acidification and whether their responses to ocean acidification are influenced by the pH and the site of calcification. So some of you in the audience probably are aware of Malcolm and colleagues' research looking at coral upregulation of pH at the site of calcification. What we're asking is whether coral and algae also do the same thing. So coral and algae range fruit from polar through to tropical ecosystems, and they're really ecologically important um, throughout their range. So not only do they create new reefs, they actually bind together reefs of other organisms. So this top right uh, photo is a reef comprised predominantly of coral and algae in the Kimberley region. So coral and algae also act as a settlement substrate for many marine invertebrates, including coral species and uh, local abalone species here in Tasmania. They also, also act as a nursery ground and a su supply of food for juvenile, juvenile invertebrates such as coral and algae. However, they are susceptible to ocean acidification, and there's quite a lot of evidence out there showing that the photosynthetic rates, uh, the mortality and recruitment rates of coral and algae were negatively impacted by ocean acidification. And there's also a raft of studies showing no effect of ocean acidification on these three parameters. Um, however, there is universal evidence that ocean acidification will negatively affect the calcification rates of coral and algae. So, Coral and algae calcify within the cell wall. They precipitate a, a type of calcium carbonate known as calcite. And as pH declines, their calcification rates or their growth rates also decline. However, there is some variability in the response of different species of coral and algae to ocean acidification. So what we're asking is whether this is somehow related to their physiology. So I'm talking a lot about ocean acidification, which is declines in seawater pH. But what you also need to know is that Coral and algae also inhabit some areas that have high variability in pH. So coral and algae calcify during the day, and during the day in some of these really shallow habitats that are dominated by large biomasses of photosynthetic organisms, such as macroalgae or corals, you can see really high pH values. So this is a really extreme example uh, from southern New Zealand where I used to work. So this is a macroalgal, uh, a giant kelp forest, and what you can see here is pH uh, follows a really strong dial cycle in, cycle in summer. So during the day, uh, pH in the seawater here increases uh, due to the drawdown of CO2 by the resident macroalgae, and at night, pH then declines. So this decline is due to either due to the respiration of the same macroalgae or due to the mixing of unaltered seawater um, back into the habitat. So some coralline algae uh, live in areas with high variability in pH. And even for those coral and algae that don't live in areas of high variability in pH in the mainstream seawater, they can also encounter high variability in pH at their surface. So like the large um, giant kelp that you saw in the previous slide, the coral and algae are also photosynthesizing and changing pH around themselves. So at their, at their surface, they actually can change pH to a great degree. So this is within what's known as the diffusion boundary layer. Now this is a layer of seawater where the movement of dissolved substances is primarily controlled by molecular diffusion. So what happens here is that as the diffusion boundary layer increases in thickness, the changes in pH at the surface of the coral and algae uh, become more extreme. So the, the example that's up here on, on the slide is uh, pH at the surface of a crustose coral and algae over time. So what we have is a pH electrode placed at the surface of the coral and algae, um, and you can see pH is on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So in the light, they increase pH due to the same uh, photosynthetic activity that's occurring on the reef scale. So they increase pH in the light and then de decrease pH in the dark. And this degree of pH change is really controlled by the water uh, velocity. So when, slow, uh, when flow is... Uh, slower, the diffusion boundary layer is thicker and larger gradients in pH occur. So even coral and algae that don't encounter reef scale pH variability can encounter high pH variability under some circumstances. Now this won't occur for all coral and algae, but it's a point to keep in mind for later in the talk. So not only can organisms encounter high variability in pH in the external seawater, some organisms can also modify pH within themselves. <coughs> 
um, and keep pH at different uh, levels within different compartments. So a well-known example of this is for coral species. So it's well known that, cor that some coral species can elevate pH at the site of calcification, and this could actually aid their calcification rates. So this figure is a figure from McCulloch et al. 2012, and what they were showing here is we've got seawater sea pH on the x-axis and calcifying fluid pH on the y-axis. Now you can see for the forams down in the bottom, they generally track the seawater pH, so they, they have uh, no real ability to maintain internal pH at a higher level. Whereas the coral species, which precipitate a form of calcium carbonate known as aragonite, uh, have relatively up-regulated uh, pH levels. So it's considered that this ability, differential abilities to upregulate pH could um, change the responses of species to ocean acidification. So those species that can maintain higher pH levels in the face of ocean acidification could respond more positively to the effects of ocean acidification. So what we're asking is, whereabouts on this, in this figure do, do coral and algae lie? Do they, have, do they demonstrate no, no upregulation? Or are they like the coral species and they can upregulate pH? So the questions of the research project is really, do coral and algae actually elevate pH at the site of calcification? And if so, how does, this, how does external pH influence coral and algal internal pH? And can their capacity to elevate internal pH influence their responses to ocean acidification? So before I even started working on this research pro project, this paper was actually published maybe a month beforehand. Um, and the, what it demonstrates is uh, a reconstruction of pH within coral and algae. So this is using the boron isotope methods, the same methods they use for the corals. So you can see here that according to the, this paper in PNES that the, the internal pH of the coral and algae is about 8.75 on average. Now this is, this is relatively high. There is a few problems with this however. So the first problem being what I, I showed earlier that maybe this particular specimen is encountering large external pH variability, but to be encountering pH 8.75 on average is a little bit unrealistic, so there must be something else going on. Uh, either they're upregulating pH, or there could be something else. So unfortunately for coral and algae, there's also another problem. So the boron isotope values of the delta 11b in carbonates records pH at the site of precipitation, but only if solely borate is incorporated. So there's two forms of boron, uh, borate and boric acid. So bor borate is what's incorporated into aragonitic corals, whereas boric acid is not incorporated into aragonitic corals. So if borate is incorporated, we can figure out what the, the internal pH or the pH at the site of calcification is for that carbonate. So a few months ago, uh, there was a paper published demonstrating that both forms of boron are actually incorporated into inorganic calcite. So this is the problem because both types of boron have different uh, boron isotope values at different pH levels. So this, this figure here sort of highlights the problem. So what we have here is the boron isotope value on the y-axis and the solution pH uh, on the x-axis. So solution pH for, the, for inorganic experiments being seawater pH, and for a, a coral, for example, this would be the pH in the calcifying fluid. Or for the coral and algae, this would be the pH within the cell wall. So if, if borate is solely incorporated into the, into the calcium carbonate, what you see is that if you have a boron isotope value, you should track that, that green line and you can figure out what the pH at the site of precipitation was. However, if boric acid's also incorporated, uh, this will give an elevated uh, boron isotope value that could uh, look like more upregulation is occurring than actually is. Fortunately, the same paper that published um, the result showing that boric acid's incorporated into inorganic calcite also demonstrated that the amount of boric acid that was incorporated uh, was linearly related to its concentration, which is proportional to the pH um, in the solution. So as pH increases, the amount of boric acid in solution decreases, and the amount um, incorporated into the calcite also declined. So using their values, you, can, you could create a rough uh, correction for that, which is this red line. So in other words, if coral and algal calcite is the same as the inorganic calcite, it has the same amount of boric acid, then it, the, their values should track on this red line. So where, where does coral and algal calcite uh, track? So if we overlay the pH and the seawater that the coral and algae from Western Australia um, that have been collected from Western Australia lie, we can see that 
they actually lie, uh, they, the boron isotope values actually lie on the line, clustered around it, bel below the line, and uh, well above the line. So from that, you could uh, conclude that, well, maybe some of them aren't re upregulating, others strangely seem to have decreased pH at the site of calcification, and others are clearly upregulating. However, this could be an incorrect interpretation as well, because the actual position of this corrected line might be different for different species of coralline algae if they're incorporating different amounts of boric acid um, into their calcite. So what we really need to know is how, for a specific species, how the, their boron isotope values track as we decrease pH. So this is some proposed research. Well, when I put this slide, that slide together, it was proposed research. We actually started this last Friday. So what we're doing is growing free coralline algal species, which has high, medium, and low boron isotope values under different CA, seawater pH levels. So 8.1, which is sort of an ambient control, 7.8, which is an ocean acidification end of the century sort of scenario, and 7.5, which is a value for us that's physiologically important, so we can sort of go further beyond on this uh, red line and see whether the values are tracking. And we also uh, control in the seawater velocity and light levels in an attempt to try and control uh, for this external modification of pH within the diffusion boundary layer. And so after several months, what we hope to do is to grow the coralline algal species uh, in this, this setup and then measure the, the boron isotope values of the new, the new growth. And hopefully we'll be able to use a technique where we can measure the uppermost proportion of boric acid that's potentially incorporated into the calcite. So from these experiments, what we're hoping to get is, um, we'll, one, we'll be able to track the position of the, the boron isotope values for each of the free species as pH declines. So two possible scenarios might be, these are simplified scenarios, uh, no upregulation, so as pH declines, it follows this red line where it, it lies directly on the red line. And then the black line, again, it's very simplified as an upregulation scenario where the values be elevated somewhat and um, they might actually decrease as, as seawater pH declines. Um, or they might stay stable. Oops. And also what we hope to do is find out where this line actually lies for these three different species at these three different pH levels. And because we're using uh, specimens with high, medium, and low boron isotope values, we're, we're hoping if this actually is an indicator of upregulation of pH, we'd be able to figure out whether um, elevated uh, pH upregulation does influence their responses to ocean acidification. Um, so at this point, I'd just like to, to thank all the people that have helped me with collecting coral and algal specimens over the last six months, and in particular to Steve Camo, who's co-set up this ex experiment with me. And that's all, thanks. <laughs>